Wonderful. Well, we uh, live in extraordinary times at the minute, don't we? Um, I don't know if you've been trying to follow along with, uh, with the news um, over just this last couple of weeks, particularly around Brexit. And, uh, you know, you will have uh, seen if you're trying to kind of work out what on earth is going on and whether anyone really does know um, what's going on, um, what all that uh, means for us um, over the coming days and weeks. Um, authority is something that has been in the news uh, a lot. This is something that uh, Laura Koonsberg, I think I'm saying that right, um, who is the political editor of the BBC, um, said, in one of the votes, I forget which one, <laughs> I think it was the 14th of March, but I'm not even sure which vote that was now, to be honest. Um, but uh, she said this. She said, the Prime Minister has been defeated again. Her authority, if not all gone, is in shreds. Uh, what do you make of that? We also then saw uh, the Speaker uh, of the House of Commons, um, Speaker Burko. Um, and, uh, and again, listening to, uh, to the radio, um, they said this. Burko has today asserted his authority. He has asserted his authority. Authority is something that uh, right now, in terms of our political system, is very much a hot potato. And this, mil this morning, I want us to think about what it means for us to say that the Bible has authority over our lives. What does it mean for the Bible to have authority over our lives. Uh, we use the word authority in lots of different ways, in positive ways and also in some negative ways. If you um, are into your sports, you know, I'm, I like a bit of rugby. <sighs> Wales aren't my side, I'm afraid, but it has to be said that you watch a game of rugby and they do say the last 20 minutes of, of a game are where the game is won and lost. And uh, whether you're a rugby fan, whether it's football, um, pick your sport. Um, you find teams who stamp their authority on a game. And in rugby, that tends to happen in those last 20 minutes, or in Wales's case, before that, uh, uh, in, uh, in many games. They stamp their authority. That is, it's a phrase that we use to talk about the quality of uh, the side, where their quality really begins to shine. You may uh, be more of a, a music lover. And, you know, a great musician, um, when uh, he or she um, puts on a really great performance, we would say that they put on an authoritative performance. If you find someone with great expertise in a subject, you might describe them as having, um, being or being the worldwide authority on a subject. If you're trying to give weight to an argument, you might say that you have it on good authority that such and such, i.e. you're appealing to the reliability of the source. If, like me, uh, you are unfortunate enough to find yourself in lots of meetings quite a lot of the time, uh, maybe you go to work and you find yourself in meetings, you'll know the difference that a chair, a good chair, who chairs the meeting well makes to the running of that meeting. A good chair will assert their authority in that room um, to ensure that things go to time and uh, that everyone behaves themselves and things are in good order. Well, a team asserting their authority uh, on a football pitch means something very different to a judge asserting their authority in a law court. The meaning of authority then varies considerably according to context. Now, I want us to think about um, Jesus and how he viewed scripture this morning, how he used the Bible. I'm just going to read some words from Matthew uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. It says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. There's an understatement for you. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes 
from the mouth of God. Now, you could be reading that in Matthew. You could, um, if you're following on with us uh, with reading through Lent, the, the Gospel of Luke, this would have been, I think, day one, um, Luke chapter four, um, as we thought about um, this story. And it's a great story. Um, it's a story that we have a huge amount to learn from of how Jesus goes out into uh, the wilderness and is tempted um, for 40 days and 40 nights, tempted to meet some of his very basic needs. But I want us very briefly to consider how it is that Jesus fights the temptation that he faces. How does he fight the temptation that he faces? Jesus was someone who had all the resources of heaven at his disposal. He could uh, fight in many different ways, and yet he chooses to fight temptation and fight the devil using the authority of scriptures. Not as a one-off or as a, a change of tactics, but each and every time, for three times in a row here, we see how Jesus responds to the tempter, as uh, Satan is described in that passage, by repeatedly emphasizing, it is written, it is written, it is written. His position is unequivocal. You're trying to tempt me, but the scriptures have spoken. And that's the end of the conversation. Jesus, time and time again, shows that he is drawing upon the scriptures as his guide. You know, Dave uh, Roderick over at Community Church um, said some really interesting things and posed uh, this question um, around, uh, around this topic. And in fact, anything good I say this morning probably has been nicked from him, to be honest. Uh, and he, he, answered this, he answered this question I want to ask us as well this morning. You know, does the Bible have influence in your life? Does the Bible have influence over your life? Or does it have authority? Now, to unpack what we uh, mean by those things, we need to understand what we mean by influence and explore what kind of authority it is that we're talking about in order to be able to explore that issue of influence versus authority. If you look up in a dictionary what it means to have authority, it says this, the power or right to give orders, to make decisions, and to enforce obedience. I can see some of you already shifting a little bit uncomfortably uh, in, your, in your seats. It's quite a stark way of uh, putting it. You know, many of you um, will look at that and recognise that we, uh, in our culture, in our society, hate the idea that anything can enforce our obedience, can give us orders or tell us what to do. You know, we live in an age obsessed with my will and what I want to do. You know, the other night, um, I, was, uh, I was hiding upstairs. And uh, I'll tell you why I was hiding upstairs in, in our house. is because every other week, uh, one of the small groups here that meets, um, meets at our house, and it's not mine, I don't hide from my own uh, small group, uh, <laughs> which does also meet at my house regularly. But uh, no, uh, the other group, which is one of Ruth's uh, groups called Colour Thursday, um, which is, is a women's only group. And so uh, what I do uh, every other week is, is hide uh, upstairs. And, uh, but, you know, I was really enjoying it this week um, as I was in, in my bedroom, uh, listening to the fun and, and, uh, and the frolics that were happening downstairs. They were clearly having lots of fun. And I could only chuckle to myself because what I was doing was listening to funeral music. I don't know if you've seen this, um, co-op funeral care each year um, do a study as to what the, um, the top playlist is, um, what the top requested songs are at people's funerals. Uh, and what's the most popular song choice at funerals? Well, you might be able to read it if you look closely there and you can actually play through. But it's this one, Frank, Frank Sinatra, My Way, My Way. We don't like the idea that someone can tell us how we live our own 
lives. That number one song there, of course, if you know it, uh, perhaps we'll play it later, is, uh, is asserting that idea that actually um, we can do things our own way. We don't like the idea of someone having authority over us. Now, some things do have authority over us, whether we like it or not. If you drive, um, the highway code has authority over you. In fact, it has power over you to enforce obedience. If you find yourself speeding, which I'm sure none of us uh, do or ever, uh, you find yourself experiencing the, the power and the authority of uh, the law. You may find yourself going to a speed workshop. Um, I think you could even do two speed workshops in a certain period of time. But if you find yourself uh, being caught again, you, uh, you find yourself with some points and you may even lose um, your license. It has the ability to enforce obedience. Now, we may not like that idea and we may not like the idea of authority but what we have to recognize is that we cannot avoid being influenced in our lives we have influence uh, pressing in upon us from lots of different quarters you know whether it's our friends and our family uh, whether it's experience that we've had in our lives whether it's our wider culture whether it's our personalities or our professional background, there are so many things that affect how you make decisions and the way in which you behave. And we're increasingly aware of that. That actually this idea that you can go your own way and not be influenced by anyone else or anything else is, of course, a complete lie. And there are some things that we don't even realize are influencing our behavior. You know, a fish is influenced by its surroundings, but may not even be aware that it is uh, relying on water. It's just something that a fish takes for granted. There are many things in our lives that we take for granted. And in recent years, we've become more and more aware of um, the positive but also the negative influences um, that are around us. We can at times be a bit like a fish in a bowl, unaware but highly influenced by those things around us. Look, for example, at social media. You know, we're increasingly aware that social media, uh, social media has created for many of us a bubble in which we uh, exist. You know, whether it be uh, the lead up to Brexit, there I bring it up again. Uh, many people, surprised by the result, realised that much of what they were reading in the news and much of what they were seeing through Twitter and Instagram and all the rest of it was a particular view of the world that may not adhere to other people's views. The US elections, you know, much of what was touted there was this idea of fake news, whether that's really a thing or, uh, or not. This, this idea that many of us are bombarded with a mix of truth and of lies. We recognise the power of images in our lives to shape the way in which we think and we behave that affect our mood, that affect how comfortable we are with the stuff that we have around us and make us want more. Make us see the airbrushed lives of others and compare our own lives and find dissatisfaction with what we've got. In that context, we can be forgiven for saying that what we want to do is to approach the Bible in that way. That actually, aware of the many influences over our life and our behaviour, we go to the Bible to be a, an influence for good in our lives. Now, there are many good things about that. There are many really important ways in which the Bible can help shape and influence our lives. There's many good things, 
But here's the challenge. What do you do when the Bible says something that you don't like? What do you do when the Bible says something that you don't like? Something that makes you feel uncomfortable. It's tempting uh, that when there are lots of debates about what the Bible means, lots of different interpretations, you can very easily, if you don't already, you can very easily find someone who will give you an opinion about what the Bible says that agrees with what you would like it to say. There's lots of debates, and it's easy to go off and find a view of what the Bible says that suits you. I think there was a comedian a little while back that said suits you quite a lot, wasn't there? Are you the final arbiter? Are you the final judge? Do you stand over the Bible and say, I will take what I want to take from uh, the Bible? And if actually I read something I don't like, I'll find an opinion about what it means so that I don't have to be challenged. Or do you accept that actually when you read the Bible and you read things that challenge you, that make you think, are you willing to give the Bible the final say in how you live your life and sit under rather than stand over the Bible? You know, the, the Bible invites us to grapple with its meaning, to debate and to discuss, to explore with one another, to question the scriptures. The scriptures uh, recognize themselves, that they're hard to understand, that they're, 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 there's something about reading the Bible that's about grappling with what it means and what it says. But do you let it have authority over you or do you simply let it be an influence in your life? So we've explored a little bit about what it means for the Bible to have influence. And actually, I would say it's important that the Bible does have influence over your life. But if we're going to say that we think it's important that Scripture has authority over us, then we have to explore a little bit about what that means. And, uh, and where do we start with that? <clears throat> I want to suggest this morning that um, the Bible has authority because it's the words of God himself. And all authority is vested in God. All authority comes from God. If you open your Bible at page number one, or um, I don't know whether it is necessarily page number one, but Genesis 1, and, uh, and you read just the first few verses of the Bible. It says, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we read there that it's God's word spoken over the world that brings the world into being, that creates the world. His words bring creation. And, and what we see there is, you know, if you like, there's nothing more authoritative than that. Saying something will happen, and it happens. Saying, speaking the world into existence, and the world coming into existence. Whenever the Bible talks about the authority of God, it talks about it in the context of God's power, of God's role in creating the world. And it speaks about how God is uh, in control and is loving and faithful. Whenever the Bible talks about the authority of God, it links his authority with his role in creating the world, loving people in the world, being faithful to them, and of his power in doing those things. God's model of authority isn't like a managing director in a business. What they say goes, and uh, there's no ifs, and those, there's no buts. Rather, what it looks like for God to have authority is it looks like him creating. It looks like him loving. 
it looks like him being faithful. It looks like him renewing the world around us. Whenever we talk about God's authority, those are the sorts of things that should be in our minds. God has authority as the creator, as the all-powerful one, but also as the loving one, loving each one of us. And so when we go to the Bible, we don't find an instruction book. We don't find a rule book. God isn't some kind of celestial kind of information service that we can apply to and plug a question in and get an answer. What we find when we come to the Bible, and the reason it has authority in our lives, is that what we find is the Bible is full of stories. The Bible is full of stories. And when we talk about what it means for the Bible to be a story, it can sometimes make us feel a bit uncomfortable because in our minds we think stories aren't real. Stories are kind of fiction. And that's not what, what we mean here. What we mean is not uh, stories that are made up, but stories that are inviting us in to the way in which God has organised the world. You know, we see in, uh, in the Bible stories that invite us in to be part of what God is doing in the world. The Bible has authority because it tells us the way in which God works. How does he work? He works by creating. He works by loving. He works by renewing the world around us. And by telling us lots of stories, what God is doing is he is inviting us in to be part of the story of him remaking the world. You know, as we embrace God's story in our lives, his viewpoint, his way of seeing the world, his version of history, it begins to change us. It begins to create new life in us as we're part of what he is doing. You know, stories have real power. Stories have real power. The 20th century is littered with examples of people who have bought into a way of viewing the world that's a story. Be it communism, be it fascism, be it what it would be like when we leave Europe or what it would be like if we stayed in Europe. There are many, many different stories, ways of understanding the world that have great power in how we live our lives and what we do with our lives. And God, in his book, in the Bible, he gives us lots of stories. Why? Because he wants us to understand how we are part of remaking the world, of loving the world, of caring for it in the way that he has set it up. And that's why it's important that we know it. That's why it's important that we know these stories. Not so that we can go like an instruction book or a rule book and take those stories and say, well, the Bible says this, therefore I need to do that. As if it's some kind of uh, information service. What it invites us to do is to know the story so that when we're living our lives, we know that whether we are living in tune with that story or not. You know, I had a proud moment this week. I was, I was reading with, um, with uh, my daughter um, some stories from the Bible. You know, we do kind of bedtime stories. We always have one that's uh, a story from the Bible. We have various different Bibles. And uh, we need to be a bit careful about them because some of them are better than others. And if you found this, if you have a, a, sort of a young toddler, you will quickly uh, discover this if you haven't already, that some of the Bible stories um, that are written for kids are, are absolutely fantastic. Uh, and some of them I, I don't rate quite as highly. And, uh, you know, my daughter wanted to uh, read the story of the prodigal son. And, uh, and, and the way she put it was this, because we had a couple of different sort of versions of it in front of us. And she said, I don't want to read that one. I want to read the one with the jealous brother. <laughs> and it was, it was a proud moment for me, because she recognised that there were different versions of the story. One of them completely forgets about the, 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 the jealous brother. And if you know anything about the story of the prodigal son, that's actually quite important to the story. Um, she, know, she wanted the one with the jealous brother. If we don't know well the story that we're in, 
we won't know when it's being told in a way that is misleading us. Satan tries to trick Jesus at his low point, at his point of real weakness, at his point of most hunger. Satan uses the Bible to try and trick Jesus. And Jesus knows the story. And he says, no, that's not everything. Really interestingly, Jesus responds, not with lots of verses from all over the Bible. He responds with quoting Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8. He just sticks to one thing, but he says, no, you've missed the point. It's not this, it's, it's this. And he's able to say the story that he is in. So choose your stories carefully. You know, give your children truth that they will grow up into rather than truth that they would grow out of grow into rather than grow out of God's truth. You know, people thousands of years ago, uh, or at least even a, a thousand years ago, couldn't dream of having the Bible in their pocket. They could not dream of having the Bible in their pocket. And yet, I wonder how long you spend with that Bible in your pocket. You know, I, I was looking at that this, this week, uh, to my shame, uh, I, I, you know, I read both a, a physical Bible, you know, a hard, you know, sort of old school Bible. Uh, I also have a Bible on my phone, and uh, and unfortunately, with the wonders of technology, I can see how long I spend in my Bible app, and how long I spend on Instagram. And uh, and I tell you what, it, it's it's a real um, sobering thing. You know, when you're tempted to choose the influence of something? Are you choosing to open your Bible, choosing to put yourself in God's story, in his way of viewing the world, rather than someone else's? Are we going to let it have a little bit of influence over our lives? Or are we going to believe that it has the authority to change the way we think, the way we act, the things we say, and the way in which we see the world around you. You may see um, this uh, picture now. You won't be able to see it very up close there, but it's a Bible um, with lots of highlighting and underlining and writing left, right and centre. You could probably see that. And there's a quote that often goes with this um, that goes like this. The person who has a Bible that's falling apart will most likely have a life that isn't falling apart. The person that has a Bible that's falling apart will most likely not have a life that's falling apart. And the reason for that is not because you go to the Bible for that one verse that gives you the answer and makes you feel better. Although, great as that is. The reason is because you choose to say, this book is the very words of God to me. It helps me to know where I sit in the world. It helps me to recognise that the world doesn't revolve around me and my life, but I'm part of something much bigger. I'm part of God's story. And as we read the Bible, as we get more and more familiar with what it says, as we debate and discuss it with one another, and we explore what its implications are for our lives, it has increasing levels of authority to help us to live for God rather than living for ourselves. Why don't we stand? I thank you um, for your word. And, um, <clears throat> and this morning, Lord, um, just reminded of that verse, Lord, that says that your word isn't chained. Your word is not chained. And this morning, Lord, I pray for each one of us. Lord, I, I pray that your word would have influence in our lives. that this week you would be speaking through your word to each one of us. But Lord, more than the, the Bible just having an influence in our lives, Lord, I pray that we would know what it means to read your word and to let it have authority in our lives because it is your word to us. It's you helping us to know where we fit 
and what our role is. It's you calling us to be part of your world and shaping that world to know your love, your faithfulness, your kindness. Helping the, us to be involved in remaking the world to be the way you are creating it to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.